this is the CLT, a safe place for you and me, possibly the best show in the Queen City that's not on TV. Hello, everybody. It is Friday. It is six o'clock. That means it is time for the CLT. And I had to change my setup around. I'm Tiffany, by the way. I'm your Charlotte Major League Soccer Team host and reporter. Hello, everyone that is joining us. Uh, I changed my setup. It looks like I'm closed off in a room, but I promise you I am safe and I will blink twice if I really need help. Uh, but seriously, it was a mad dash to get up here and get set up. Um, I was in a stairwell taking cover. We had some scary weather rolling through, so I hope that you all managed to stay safe as well. So I wanna thank you for joining us. I'm glad that you all are safe. And I am very excited as I am every week about our guest today who has been your eyes and your ears on the sidelines for some of the biggest men's and women's matches. Uh, she's done it all when it comes to soccer, when it's come to sports, and she is now in what I call the waiting room or the request hotline. Let's patch her through. Yes! Woo -woo! Hey! I have to give you a proper going? introduction. Everybody, please welcome in your Drinks with Binks on Fubo TV host. You're also on SNY. You're everywhere. Everyone, Julie Stewart Binks. Oh, wow. Thank you, everyone. Oh, wait, that was awesome. That was great. Thank you, <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And guys, I want to remind you, we're going to be answering your questions throughout this if you have any for Julie, so you can type them in. We have a lot of mutual friends, but we've never actually met before. I know. It's nice to meet you. And I'm so pumped to hear that you're with Charlotte because I I didn't really know your, your interest in MLS. And I've obviously seen you on NFL Network. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great that Tiffany Blackman's going to be with Charlotte MLS team because... It's just great. You were able to bring so much of your experience covering some of the biggest sports and teams in the world to a new team, which is going to help it so much. So it's also great to like expand the soccer. Uh, I, I don't want to say sort of like the soccer um, clique or like group to everyone else in the world. Cause sometimes it's like, it's like a, it's like this club and that yeah. everyone that's sort of like, Oh, you, you know, you have to go through all these tests to be a part of, soccer in the U.S. and it's like no 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 soccer is obviously for everyone that sounded really weird um <laughs> soccer is it, it like did that? Not. <laughs> um but I yeah I used to play growing up and I and I loved it and then I played in college so uh it's nice and it was great for me to get the opportunity to come back to the game that like I started yeah, off with yeah. so it's been pretty cool sorry I didn't sound kind of like that you were just like <laughs> some random person that came to planet earth and was like your soccer no obviously um obviously you know the sport well and just but just your experience in in broadcasting and just different sports it's going to be great so You're i'm pumped Thank i'm you. pumped to to meet you <laughs> and to, to see what mls and charlotte's all about and just to to hang and talk about some sports and some awesome stuff during a really tough time right now so Good yeah, I know. It's been tough on everybody. So hopefully this is a, a bit of a reprieve for everyone to get to tune in and, and just talk about soccer and, and this new team. And I know you've been in the game for, for a long time. You've covered so much MLS and I mean, even on the women's side too. And you've covered two consecutive MLS Cups, right? Like on two different networks on Fox and on ESPN. So you've seen it all. So I'm, I'm excited to, to actually pick your brain later on at another time. <laughs> Um, and can we get you to Charlotte when we do play? Is that a possibility? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. You know what? I've um, I've been to North Carolina before, but I've, I've never actually stepped out of the Charlotte airport. So I was like, I've never been to Charlotte before. Um, and so I was like, oh, this would be really cool to see a soccer team there. You know, it's such a great sports state and a sports city that this is inevitably going to be a huge hit there. So um, of course, when Charlotte is playing in MLS and we are back, I will definitely come and see what the city has to offer. You can show me around like what the cool, what the cool spots are there, Tiff. You know, I need to know. I need to be in the know. I feel like I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do what I, I'll do what I can. I'll do what I can. So I have to throw a curveball at you because I looked at your bio because that's what I did with everybody. In your Twitter bio, it says you're named after 
a dog? I need, I just need the backstory on this. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of random, actually, because, like, who names their dog Julie would be sort of the, the weird part. But, yeah, my mom growing up, they had a French poodle named Julie the Poodle. And it was, like, this dog that everyone in the family was obsessed with. It was almost like a human. It understood them. The, everything they did and they loved it and apparently it was like whoever had the first child in the family that was a girl they were going to name the dog Julie so it's like it wasn't even it wasn't even like oh we want the the girl's name to be Julie we know that our daughter's name is going to be Julie because of this dog so um, they always had to, then they always had to be like Julie the dog or Julie the person and even um I was at you know, a couple years ago I was at my grandpa's funeral and someone was like oh this is Julie the person I was like, oh my gosh, this is oh, wild wow. that like this dog just, it was, it was like, I'm, I'm not as cool as the dog. The dog was <laughs> far none, just like the best thing in the world. So yeah, it's kind of weird, but it's cool because dog sounded awesome. That is a pretty good backstory. <laughs> not what I was expecting. Yeah. Um, I did see a question pop up. Someone asked, uh, do you have a favorite MLS team? Um, well, I'd have to say like, I'm from Toronto. So growing yeah. up, like when MLS came to Toronto, that was huge for the city. And, you know, the city had always been kind of known as this like loser city with, uh, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And at the time, the, you know, the Raptors were a new franchise as well earlier in, in, in the mid nineties. And then like the Blue Jays hadn't won since the early nineties. So getting like a soccer team in literally the most multicultural city in the world was great. I used to be a tour guide in Toronto. So <laughs> I know these things I can, I can track back on them. So yeah, it, I mean, Toronto FC um, is, is my team, but like, you know, as a journalist, like you just don't really cheer. You don't, you don't cheer for a team. You're just like, you cheer for interesting outcomes and cool storylines and, and I wanted people to know that when I was covering it, like I was really privileged to be on the sideline for an MLS cup in Toronto two years in a row against Seattle. And I loved covering the Seattle Sounders. I have nothing but respect for Brian Schmetzer, who I was there when Siggy Schmid was there and then he got fired and Brian sort of like came in as this interim head coach and he was sort of like, oh, well, we'll, it, it, the vibe was almost like, we'll, we'll see what Brian can do. And then when he took them on this run and they had the second half of the season, that was incredible. Still, there was this sort of element of doubt of like, is he the guy or isn't he the guy? And then, you know, I always remember talking with him and being like, listen, I know I'm from Toronto. I'm going to be on the sideline for this game. Like I I care as much about you guys winning this as I do my own team because I really liked him as a person and I liked the people and every, every experience I had with Seattle, which was extremely professional and they cared about me and they wanted me to do well. And so I was like, I, you know, I want them to do well too. So I when it was odd because it was like when, even when Seattle won and Toronto lost, like I wasn't upset because it was, First of all, really odd game. There was like not even any shots in the entire game. Um, and it was one on penalty kicks. And so that was like really odd. Sure, it was like, you know, sad to see Toronto lose, but it was good that they had they had an MLS Cup. Like that was a win in itself. And 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 I had an experience even that year, which was really cool, where I got to work the second leg for any of you guys who remember this it was in a Incredible game, the second leg between yeah. Toronto and Montreal in the 2016 playoffs. And it was just like, that is my favorite, my favorite game ever in history of covering MLS because it was like, you know, Montreal's coming in three up three, two in the first leg. And as someone from Toronto, like there is definitely a big difference between English and French speaking Canada and just historically and the idea of back in in the mid nineties of, of Quebec wanting to separate from Canada. So there's like all these and the Leafs and the Habs and sort of like all these different tensions, cultural tensions between the two cities. I was like, Oh, already this is really cool to be on the sideline of. And then the game was just banana sandwich. <laughs> and it was, I mean, there were so many goals in this game. And, and as you know, working like on a sideline you, as in that position, you're just like, it's almost like you're doing math the whole time. You're like, yeah. okay, so wait, okay, this one goal means extra time. Okay, no, this would mean this and this and this. And then you're also like, okay, if this game ends in regulation right now, like, who am I interviewing? What are my three, my two questions? Yes. Like, what right now? You're just like, 
you're almost just like in shock. You're just like, okay, what happens? You know, X plus Y equals Z, what's going on? And <laughs> that game also goes down as like, there's this incredible photo of me, which is like the most Yes, we were talking about, we were talking about that with the, our producer today. <laughs> is, is, okay, for any of one who hasn't seen this photo, I at the, okay, so in this game, it was raining and I kept putting my hood on and off because it's like, put the hood on when the rain's going, take it off when you have to go on air. Just, you know, a little bit of dampering. But in doing that, I was like moving my hair more and more up. No <laughs> one tells me that my hair, okay, I look, whatever. My, no, one, no one tells me about my hair like that. I, no. I interviewed Josie Altador <laughs> at the end of the game. And my producer at the time, who is still a really good friend of mine, and he's one of the best producers in the world, I will not say his name because he feels bad that he didn't really <laughs> give me enough of a heads up. But he knew that, he said he knew that, like, I did, wouldn't have cared about my hair, which is true. I wouldn't have. At the end of a game like that, I just would have been like, what can I possibly do? Yeah. My hair looked like, it looked like. Uh, like a I'm rat sorry, someone nest. said it's their screensaver. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> and I think the best part about it is like, you can't, I don't know, it looks like that. So I'm just like smiling like this. And after the game, I still, I kid you not, 40 minutes after that moment happened, I still didn't even know I looked like that. Cause no one would tell me. Cause every, you know, people are like, uh, wow. Like we're going to tell the national reporter. She doesn't even know she looks like that. Someone must have told her. I think everyone was like, someone must have told her. And then we all went, the PR person for Fox, she came up to me. She was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Like, she was like trying to fix my hair when I came into the TV truck. And then we all went for dinner after the game. And I just saw my phone had like 10, that, well, not 10, it had like a hundred <laughs> tweets with that picture. So it was a very watch, well-watched game. And we were all at dinner and we were crying laughing. And my producer was like, I feel so bad. He was like, I, I really, I was like, I don't care. Also, I messed up in that game. I like kind of had a bit of on-air blunder. And the fact that that hair thing happened, like people completely like, forgot. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, they, it made me seem like I worked harder. It's like, if you have, if you, your hair looks bad, your makeup's running down your face because of the rain, people think you're working harder. You were working. Like, well, sideline is like, it's, it is a sport in itself. It running is. Running around, trying to keep up with the storylines. But you, you mentioned your, your favorite game. So I saw a question float by too. Um, funniest interview or favorite player to interview. You mentioned your love for, for Seattle. Anybody on that, on that squad? Oh, um, that's a great question. They had some very interesting personalities on the squad. Love Brad Evans, sure. speaking of Seattle. Incredible. The guy is, uh, was a, an amazing soccer player, a very underrated soccer player. I think he kind of got the short end of a stick near the end of his career, but just very um, uh, cerebral. Like every question you'd ask him, he would have a, a very, cal not calculated, but he'd have a, an articulate answer and he'd, he'd help you understand the game better and understand their perspective. Because when you interview athletes, a lot of the time, like, it's an interesting, as you know, this, Tiffany, it's an interesting relationship of, like, you want to find out information. You want to help tell the story. But, like, they don't want the wrong thing to be said. They don't want uh, to have a quote that then becomes the headline of somewhere. And all these guys are, like, big team guys. They don't want it to be all about them. But they don't get that, like, if these things help us understand and 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 grow our interest in the game when it's like someone is like how did you feel when you were left off of the you know u.s squad and how how did you feel when you weren't in the starting 11 it's like yeah i felt really bad about myself and i questioned what i was doing like something like that it's like great that's how normal people would feel like we're not trying to for the most part we're not all just trying to get like clickbait headlines especially in mls and mls needs needs eyeballs and attention and like it is, it's a great league. It's a great sport in the country. It's just like, it's hard to, it's a crowded space, but the personalities, the personalities make it. So other ones, I mean, I always loved Benny Failhaber, who is also now recently retired. Just, just guys that, that, that were really interesting, gritty guys on the field, but then also like would say something off of it and maybe a little bit funny too. So and there's a lot of Portland Timbers guys like Nat Borchers, Liam Ridgewell. Um, there's just. I want to shout out too. Yeah. I'm going to jump in here real fast because I just saw Grant Walls is asking you a question. He said, "What's your personal road record? Um, your personal game for? Uh, excuse me, I'm butchering this question totally because it's going by personal record for consecutive days 
on the road for work. <laughs> well, it's great to see Grant Wall here. As is, uh, now I'm nervous. So I've got to perform. He is the, the professional. <laughs> so he is the man in soccer. And he actually, Grant would know this well, because I did the Women's World Cup in 2015 and then went directly to the Gold Cup after that, which is a literally insane. And at the time, I was like, great, I'm on both of these. And you know, you get an opportunity. You're like, I'm, go I'm going for it. My relationship at the time was tested in a lot. It was about 57 days, or no, 58 days, I think it was, because I then tacked on, um, I did MLS All-Star Game, and then I tacked on an MLS game in Chicago afterwards. Because then you start feeling like, I can keep going. Like, I don't need to go home, an apartment. I've got one bag, and I can keep going <laughs> with this. And Grant was so selfless and considerate to me, because... Um, my bosses, you know, for the most part, the big executives, I don't think they really necessarily thought what this would do physically and mentally to someone having to travel that much. It's, it's, a, it's a lot. And you're always very dehydrated and you can't sleep and all this stuff. But Grant was so nice. He got me, uh, he paid for me to have a massage in Philadelphia when we were there for our uh, Gold Cup game. And it was like, just that that was, first of all, he understood what I was going through yeah. and like knew that like, wow, yeah, I an hour long massage is such a nice thing to give to a reporter who is just run ragged. And so that was beyond considerate. So Grant, I also, buddy, yeah, my take Rest after a pro. He, just calls, <laughs> he called you a legend. He's the man. I need to, I need to apparently get to meet Grant. <laughs> yes, yes. And he's giving out, he, he's paying for free massages for everyone. I think that's like the thing that he's, that he's known for. So hit him up. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to shout out uh, Kenny Cooper's on here. So I don't know if nice. you ever any uh, any a chance to interview him at all. Um, I I mean if I if I did interview you, Kenny, yes. I I <laughs> it was very memorable. Um, no, <laughs> uh, I can't, I can't remember at the moment, but I I perhaps I have. And I need to get more into. Um, you know, you talked about being in Toronto and, and hockey, too, with some of your background. How did you make that transition then into soccer? Yeah, well, honestly, like, I did my master's in England at uh, City University, and I lived right near Emirates Stadium. So I would hear the games from my very, very small flat and was like, wow, this is awesome going by the pubs. You know, everyone's just drunk all the time watching football. And I got the opportunity to intern at Sky Sports. And it was so neat because I'd, I'd come from this sort of sheltered, very Canadian life my whole time growing up where everyone just played hockey and was e eating beaver tails and drinking Tim Hortons. <laughs> and now I was like, well, this is a cool thing that, uh, that they have in, in England. And so the Canadian women's national team was something that like I always followed and grew up with and, and was very inspired by the Can Canadian men's national team like not very good at all no. <laughs> that's that's fine that's that's not anything ridiculous I'm saying but when I was there and I got really into it and then I was able to when I I my my um my class let me go to like uh, White Hart Lane it was like a my my professor took me there and then like we're getting to see what it's like training and interviewing the guys and we went to Stanford Bridge it's like with Carlo Ancelotti I'm like wow this is amazing I'm right here at these incredible Harry Redknapp world-class managers so when I came back to Canada, trying to get a job anywhere, I, you know, did an audition. I got a job at Fox Soccer Report, which was a show that was on Fox Soccer Channel. Yes. No longer exists. And I was kind of like, um, I was editing, I was writing scripts. And to be honest, like, I didn't know all the lingo that how to write highlights in soccer. And so I learned it just like being thrown in there and having to write for a lot of these pretty big broadcasters. Took some detours after that to try to get more on-air experience. But then when I got my job at Fox Sports 1 in L.A., oddly enough, like, they were, they had to host, they had to launch a soccer show. Kind of, it was like, we have to launch a soccer show. We don't have a host yet. So they're looking at a bunch of people. And I had been hired, and I was like, hey, like, I'd love to, I'd love to audition for this. And then I did. And the weird thing was, like, Fox Soccer, or Fox Soccer Daily, which was a show I hosted on yeah. FS1, took over from Fox Soccer Channel, which went dark that day. So the people that I had oddly enough been like writing their scripts for and sort of like being editing their clips, they all, that all went dark. And then I took over and it was sort of like, all right, the interns won. Like, uh, I'm back. No, I'm, <laughs> it, was, it was sort of like a passing of the baton in, in, in an odd, odd 
sort of oddly poetic way. So yeah, and then just sort of ran with it. And I've, I've had, and I've, I've said this many, many times, of all the sports I've covered, of all the experiences I've covered, I have had such a great time with MLS. I told this to MLS Commissioner Don Garber, who was on my show. I was going to bring have... up your interview with him, which I watched, which was really good. Was oh, thank you. He was great. I mean, he is an accessible commissioner who is a regular guy who is also holds one of the biggest jobs in sports and in soccer. And that is very relatable and understandable when you can have an honest conversation with this person and they can show you why they're doing what they're doing, especially as it, it has come right now to the coronavirus pandemic. But with MLS, I've always felt respected by every single player. I've never felt, you know, harassed by them or treated like I was lesser than, or, you know, you feel sometimes stigmas being a female in a male dominated industry that, oh, I don't belong here. I've always felt like I, I always felt like they wanted me on the sideline. I mean, for the most part, I've had some coaches who did not want me on the sideline <laughs> listening to them. But the players and the general managers and, and the technical directors, I, I felt very welcomed. And I miss that. Like, I miss that sort of family and them caring about me. Like, they cared who I was and what I did. And, and like, I was like, wow, this is odd. This doesn't happen. So it was, it was a great experience. That's awesome. There's uh, I see some more questions coming through. So this, this is a really bad transition, but I'm not going to leave you hanging, Bryce. You mentioned beaver tails. So yes. how do you eat? Is it fried? Is it? Uh, please explain. Yeah, it's a Canadian delicacy. It is basically fried dough. And then I like the sweeter ones where you get sort of like cinnamon, butter, and then cinnamon sugar on there, but you can get flour. It's I don't know. I think you probably have an equivalent of it in the States, maybe some sort of like elephant's ear or I don't know what, but it's, it's shaped. <laughs> it's like fried dough. Wait, so it's is... fried dough. So it's not like the, it's not the animal people. Just no, so... no, no. We, I mean, I don't put it past people. Like people eat weird stuff, but I don't think people are eating literal beaver tails that would probably not be very tasty. I know, um, I should call it Takia Spikes, uh, former NFL player, uh, he, he, it was skunk. I remember seeing it in his Instagram. It was, no, <laughs> maybe I got, yes, it's from Alabama, but that's a, that's a hard, uh, that's a it sounds hard like time. that'd be really difficult to be able to actually <laughs> eat skunk when you know that's very dangerous for you to know. <laughs> so since you have so much experience in covering the MLS, you've seen expansion teams come aboard, uh, what are some of the expectations for those teams when they get in and what have they, what have they done right to, you know, draw in that kind of fan base? Well, I mean, I think the expectations are pretty high for any expansion franchise right now after what we have seen with LAFC recent, most recently with uh, Atlanta United. Now, of course, enter Miami it's franchises are coming in and they are making a huge statement and, that is to go from who they end up having as their coaches, what players they bring in, what kind of money they're willing to spend, their stadiums. From top to bottom, it is, they are, they're just, they're coming in and making a statement. It's almost like a peacock. It's like, hey, I'm here. Like, these are my feathers. And so we're not seeing franchises as much sort of like come in and sort of like, like come in under the radar. It's like, we want to see what is it like what was what was the bid all about why should we care about you guys and and people are and the i mean these clubs are showing why we should care at least the ones we've seen recently i mean at the end of the day it's all about who you put on the pitch and how they work together and so yes you are going to be able to want to bring in big names that you can and and the money that you're able to to allocate to these players and and but also we're seeing like a number of, it's very interesting. I think Atlanta United is like a great, um, you know, it's a great template of like what works is, is being able to find some of these guys from around the world. The, the Miguel Almiron's, the uh, Joseph yeah. Martinez's, the, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a ton of guys and that maybe aren't as big names that, that have so much talent. That's your scouting department. That's, that's being able to look around the world and see who is maybe like they're doing well in their league. But we bring them here, we make them stars, and then they go off and play around the world. So, but then it's also being able to see who are the guys that are in America that are already very good, but because there are stigma, there's stigma against college players, against homegrown players, against U.S. players, that it's like, oh, they're not as good, or oh, they didn't come from Europe. It's like, 
but they're still very good athletes. They still have an incredible work rate. They have a, a reason to be on the pitch. How do you but, shake that kind of stigma? Um, it's just prove it's just proving people that that yeah. they can do it. It's it's giving a lot of these players an opportunity and then showing that they they deserve to be there. That's kind of like like everything. But that starts then with the technical directors, with the owners, with the coaches, and so it is a lot about the coaches and then how they work with the players, right? Like you can bring in some of the best players in the world, but then it doesn't really transfer over here because maybe they don't work well with the coach and then they're not happy with the chemistry on the pitch. And then maybe who knows, like they don't like the city or something. Their, their family doesn't like it. So it's like, there's so many things to think about that people don't realize this doesn't happen in the NFL. This doesn't really happen in NBA. Like sure. You have players that come from abroad, but you don't have, you don't have most of your players coming no. from like relocating their families after already being successful around the world to come to your country. So there's a lot of moving parts. We've already got a ton of support. Mid City Collective is, is one of our uh, supporter groups here. And I saw a question go by. I typed it out so I wouldn't forget it. And um, they had asked, uh, have you had any interesting experiences with MLS supporter groups? Yeah, I'd say for the most part, like everyone's been – very kind like they're I haven't had anything I'm like what does that mean I'm like what how does that answer that question I know when I was in Orlando when I was in Orlando City uh for their opening match at opening the stadium I was allowed to come up and be like in the supporters section and I was like I was I was like right in it because it was the first standing section in North America designated that in a and so that usually, uh, if I were maybe one of those people, you'd be like, why is this reporter coming in here? Blah, blah, blah. She's not part of us. And everyone was, couldn't have been happier that, that, you know, I was able to be in there or I was able to come in there. They wanted me to wear an Orlando City jersey. And I was like, I, I can't on TV. So that, that wasn't, they didn't really like that. But I was like, I'm sorry, I can't, on ESPN, I can't wear that right now. I have to be impartial. But yeah, for the most part, like I haven't gotten you know, I know a um, couple different reporters, like Rachel Bonetta did a whole in the stands, yeah. beyond, beyond the pitch type of thing, getting in there with the fans and stuff. And, like, to be honest, I was always on the field, so I didn't really get to be in with the supporters a whole lot, but they always showed me a lot of respect. Of course. And, and uh, drinks with Binks, I do want to talk about that. So what is your favorite drink? <laughs> What well, I have to say, I'm, you know, I'm definitely a fan of all year rosé, which I'm going to dip into after this Instagram live. And <laughs> I'm a big fan of that, but I love whiskey sours with egg white. I've been trying my hand at cocktails during this time. Are you and, any good? Um, I'm still working on the egg white aspects okay. of it because... That's the, the weird part because you don't want to be having getting salmonella poisoning just trying to make a whiskey sour. So I'm like, all right. <laughs> I, I and I I also used boxed eggs egg white at one point because I was like, let me try this. It's not good. But yeah, um, and Canadian beer. Like I I'm pretty. I'm not very bougie at all, other than my expensive like champagne taste. I guess I love that, but I don't afford. I can't afford that. But yeah, I, I'm an equal opportunity employer for alcohol. You keep it it's fairly simple besides trying to simple, do the yeah. egg white kind of thing. That's my, yeah. like, at my kind of speed. Uh, one more question. Someone had asked, uh, what's the best home atmosphere uh, in the MLS? Mm, that's great. You know, it's always going to be Seattle and Portland, at least for me, when I was sort of in the thick of it. The Cascadia Cup rivalries were some of the best I'd ever seen because, you know, it went back very very far to the NASL days and that was even that was the first time I ever talked with Brian Schmetzer when he was an assistant coach with Seattle was you know he played in those those matches and it was something that is sort of like in your blood and whether it was in Seattle or in Portland like it was deafening and you know I'm sure you've been on the sideline of games where like you can't even hear yourself think like you're I'm trying to hear my producer in my ear and I'm also I can't even talk I can't even hear myself talk and I'm I'm on air and it's it's but that is what all of this is about and like the rivalries are what makes it and what we saw with the MJ doc was that yeah. rivalries and like having grudges and hating other players on the pitch is like what makes sports great and like what ups the ante yeah like sure we don't want to take anyone out or like actually hate them but like to give them a good go on the pitch is great and 
And I'd say, I guess like CenturyLink would have been it. Like you wouldn't think that because it is sort of this, it's an NFL stadium, but yeah. they pack it. When it's packed and they open up the, the upper tier, it's one oh, of yeah, the best that places. Scenic, that view is, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's one of the best places to, to watch a soccer game. And everyone there is just so soccer savvy. And that's uh, like the soccer IQ of MLS fans is incredible. And they just, they know everything. They are involved and it's, it's I you know it's it's too bad like we all miss it right now but I also think MLS is like to you know to speak to Don Garber and what he's done they've been a league that's like very calculated they in a very good way they're they're socially conscious they they want they understand what their players and their families need and they are they're not gonna they're not gonna try to do anything to be brash or to just like gain money for themselves like they just they just seem like they seem like a very this is why they're one of the best leagues they always win one of these sports business journal leagues of the year they're they're a great league to to cover but yes that they're also a very loud league too so it's been fun i want to give him one more question before we let you off the hook um which would you pick play by play or color for montreal or sideline reporter for toronto um, you know, it's a very interesting question. I think I would have to go with sideline for Toronto because my French is pretty bad. I, <laughs> I know it's a bilingual city and it is a bilingual country, but my French, uh, je ne sais pas, uh, any color commentary in Montreal. Um, that's, I, I don't know. So that would be, that's one of my, one of my statements I know in French, but yeah, I think we're, it's great to see, a, you know, number of females getting analyst jobs and color yeah. commentary jobs in MLS as well. And Tiffany, I'm excited for you. I know we're still a ways away from the team in Charlotte, but you're going to have an awesome time. You're going to meet some crazy, crazy fans and like a lot of probably weird people too, but they have nothing but love <laughs> in a good way, not in a weird way. And the players and the, you, you get to, you just get a lot of access, the accessibility of MLS and its players and, and the coaches is, is really better than any other league. It's almost like what we saw with the XFL that was going yeah, on. Yeah. That, and, and for me, at least like I would talk to coaches during the game and, and get insight from them and kind of sort of, instituted being able to talk to them during substitutions to be able because not everyone in the U.S. Ex understands when why a player is coming off and why one's coming on what does that mean or like maybe something else is happening so they were always happy to field my many many annoying questions so it was great thank you for this insight has been I'm sure everyone else enjoyed it but personally I enjoyed it as well because yeah. I know what to expect a bit more now uh, we so appreciate your time, Julie. And yeah, thanks for having me on. Thank yes, you I'm so sure much. everyone is like, wow, I'm smarter now for having listening, listened to that. I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to find some rosé now. I look like yeah, I'm yeah. In the room. But I'm I know. Not. I was like, should I have the rosé before? And I'm like, no, you have a show that says you drink on it. You don't need to, like, always be drinking, okay? Maybe <laughs> sober for one interview would be good. So. I should have spiked my mug, so next yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> quarantine away. Well, right. I appreciate you having me on. And all you fans out there, thanks for jumping on and asking questions. And everyone stay safe. Stay home. And uh, so we can get through this and get out onto the pitch and watch some soccer soon enough. Heck, yeah. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany. Bye. Bye. I want to thank you guys for joining uh, that call in with, with Julie Stewart Binks. That was a lot of fun and super insightful. Uh, we'll be posting that, the full interview to YouTube. And then once I hit end on this, it's going to go up on the Instagram account. So you can tune in and watch the full interview then. Uh, we will see you next Friday with another special guest. So thanks. See you guys soon. Bye. This is the CLT, a safe place for you and me. Possibly the best show in the Queen City that's not on TV.